Hello, future challengers. Or current challengers looking for ways to improve. This is the fifth in a series of videos about how to succeed in the counterside ranked gauntlet PvP mode. Last time, we covered the nuances of defensive mechanics like MDL and valid hit absorption. This time, we're going to talk about when and why a screen filling energy beam would be considered a melee attack, whether your flying unit needs anti ground damage resistance how these resistances and bonuses stack with several others and can make frontliners incredibly hard to kill, and then we'll cap things off with how damage tolerance works and a breakdown of evasion and accuracy. This isn't exactly intended to be a gear guide, but since most of these stats overwhelmingly come from gear, understanding the nuances of these stats should be very helpful when it comes to deciding on what to use and what to enhance. Timestamps for each mechanic are provided, as usual. There will be math, there's no avoiding that. But at the end of this two-part miniseries, you'll have knowledge of defensive and offensive mechanics to rival the most dedicated leaderboard chasers this game has ever known. Incidentally, it is thanks to them that I even know most of this stuff as well as I do. Anyway, let's do this thing. Starting off, let's talk about the video thumbnail, and what even is a melee or ranged attack. Whether something is a melee or ranged attack depends only on how close the target is to the attacker, specifically how close the circles underneath units are to each other. From the attacker's point of view, units within this range are in melee distance, and units beyond it are in ranged distance. So a massive map-wide attack, like Awaken Lee Su Yun's ultimate, can at the same time be both a melee and ranged attack. Melee damage increase will increase the damage dealt to targets within the melee distance of the attack, and range damage increase will increase the damage dealt to targets within ranged distance of the attack. Similarly, melee damage res will decrease the damage taken from within melee distance, and range damage res will do the same at range distance. In effect, melee or range damage increase and melee or range damage resistance cancel each other out. For this reason, rearmed Elizabeth and offensively geared Kang, or rearmed Kang, prefer to have melee damage bonuses even though the game classifies them as rangers. And defensively geared Kang, or Re Kang, as well as Spira and Horizon, strongly prefer melee damage res because they spend a lot of their time on the field on top of enemies. Melee damage res is also very helpful for fighting off terror teams and other types of rushes. So, we've established whether something is a melee or a ranged attack depends on the unit being attacked, and not on the attacker. The same pattern is true for ground and air damage too. If a unit is flying, anti-air damage increases the attacker's damage against that unit, and anti-ground damage does not. By contrast, the flying unit needs anti-ground damage res to protect itself from damage by units on the ground, and anti-air damage res to protect itself from flying units. Like melee and range damage before, anti-location damage and anti-location damage resistance directly negate each other. Since the majority of units in the game are on the ground, it's standard practice to give attackers high amounts of anti-ground damage and give frontliners high amounts of anti-ground damage res. Anti-air damage and anti-air damage res are typically skipped, except in the case of the arms race between Awaken Horizon killers, which are often flying units, and Awaken Horizon herself. Because anti-air stats are normally ignored, flying units have a damage dealing and damage resisting advantage in PvP though they typically have lower HP too. Ranged, melee, anti-air, anti-ground damage, as well as type and anti-roll damage, and all their respective resistances, all get mushed together into what's called Group 1 damage modifiers. Back in August of 2022, the game had a major overhaul to its damage formula and calculations, so the developers decided to share these changes with the community. Thanks to that decision, there is an official blog post with a ton of specifics about damage mechanics. I'll be linking it in the pinned comment below. 
It's not an easy read, with relevant information being scattered all over the place, but it's a great resource if you have questions you want answered. For now, let's focus on Group 1 and its place in the damage formula. The important bit is that all of these bonuses and resistances are additive, and are then multiplied by the defensive multiplier, which gives an overall damage multiplier. The two key takeaways are that between defense and type 1 resistances, you can reduce damage taken by as much as a factor of 5, only taking 20% of the damage that they'd normally take. The other key takeaway is that if you're close to reaching the maximum level of damage reduction, the benefit of an extra bit of group 1 resistance can be massive. In the best case scenario, something like 5% more anti-ground damage res might actually reduce your unit's damage taken from ground units by 20%. If their overall post-damage formula reduction went from 75% to the max of 80%, then instead of taking 25 damage from a 100 damage hit, they'd only take 20 damage. This is why high anti-ranged and anti-melee damage res potentials on inhibitor gear are so desirable, and why for PvP, upgrading Gordia's accessories to T7 is a great early investment. Realistically, in higher leagues, most people are going to have gear with high anti-ground and anti-defender or anti-striker options, and you're unlikely to reach the coveted 80% damage reduction against the biggest threats to your frontliners. In lower leagues though, you can make them borderline unkillable if you back them up with some heals and barriers. Also, units with only anti-ground damage and no other group 1 damage bonuses will end up doing a lot less damage, and sometimes just a bit of HP can make all the difference in a fight. Since flying units aren't affected by anti-ground stats, that means they'll have a much easier time breaking through the group 1 resistances of their targets, so their damage tends to be more reliably high even if they don't have anti-defender or anti-striker damage on their gear options. I would talk about the defensive portion of the damage formula and how there's a defense stat penalty in PvP, uh, but the specifics aren't really that important, because nobody intentionally brings defensive debuffers into PvP, and the defense bonus set is probably always going to be worse than the HP bonus set, so it just makes the math needlessly more complicated for no real benefit. Just focus on group 1 damage bonuses and damage res, because that's something you can actually influence in a big way. There's no such thing as too much type 1 resistance in PvP, but you can use an understanding of group 1 resistance to recognize that most tanky frontliners hit the 80% cap for most PvE content, and that you can swap some of their tank gear for something which actually helps them, like increasing their skill haste, or evasion, or even their anti-ground damage if their damage output is decent. So now, we're finally ready to talk about Damage Tolerance. Damage Tolerance is a stat that appears in the details page of Strikers Who Have It. All Awakened SSR Strikers have Damage Tolerance, as well as Rearm Desterosa, Rearm Titan, Nael, and regular Lee Suyon. The value is always 2%, and what this means is that each time a unit with Damage Tolerance takes a hit from an attacking unit, it increases its group 1 resistance to that unit by 2% until reaching the group 1 maximum damage reduction of 80%. This bonus is reset when the unit with damage tolerance dies, so you want to try hard to keep that unit alive if you're using them as a damage sponge. Unfortunately, since the main threat to strikers is snipers, and snipers tend to have slow and high damage attacks, Damage Tolerance is unlikely to have a big impact on that matchup most of the time. On the other hand, in a chaotic battlefield with multiple frontliners and healing, a striker with Damage Tolerance can become a near unkillable meat wall. Many of you have probably met a Riam Desterosa that just refused to die, and this is probably a big part of why. This is also part of why Awake and Jushi Yun Hospital teams can feel so oppressive when you don't bring a high damage long-range sniper to deal with them. So that's it for all the group 1 damage stats. 
Now, for the coup de grace, let's talk about hit chance in evasion. The evasion stat, as a percentage, is the chance of evading an attack. A successfully evaded attack cannot be a critical hit, and its damage will be cut down to 90% of the attacking unit's hit chance, plus a bonus, usually between 4 and 8%, with a higher bonus given for lower accuracy scores. However, if an attacking unit has about twice as much of the hit stat as the target unit's evasion, or 1.875 times as much to be precise, the whole evasion check is ignored and the attack automatically hits. A simpler way to figure out if a unit's hits will ignore the target's evasion is to see if their actual hit percentage chance is higher than the target's evasion percentage chance. Just keep in mind that this doesn't account for any ship bonuses, unit buffs, or debuffs, etc. You can only check those numbers after a battle is over, but if you're consistently seeing the same units with roughly the same evasion chance, that should tell you what to aim for if you want your attacker to ignore evasion. You can do the same thing in reverse to make sure your frontliners, or even backliners' evasion stats won't be getting ignored. Because late game equipment for attackers often ends up being either double maze accessories or double spectral accessories, all of which have hit as their base stat, backline units become increasingly more likely to ignore the evasion checks, especially against other backline targets, when using large range ultimates. On the other hand, because it takes almost twice as much hit to ignore evasion, but equally leveled accessories increase hit and evasion stats by the same amount, it actually becomes easier to prevent your unit's evasion from being ignored if you purposely use two leveled evasion accessories. Still, the biggest factor in the hit and evasion arms race is going to be a unit's base stats. If their evasion starts off with zero, there's probably no salvaging it. Similarly, Crestal Shaolin's base 2500 accuracy is undodgeable by most units, regardless of what equipment you give them. And even if you could evade her attacks, such high accuracy is going to mean that most of her damage will still land. At least maybe you could stop her from benefiting from critical damage? Nope. Her basic attacks have assured crit, which means that even if they miss, they're still going to get a critical multiplier. The only safe place from her is out of range, or in the skies. On that note, let's talk about perfect evasion and assured hit. As you might have guessed, these guarantee successful evasion and guarantee a successful hit, respectively. And if a unit fires an assured hit against a unit with perfect evasion, then they just cancel each other out, and the normal hit and evasion calculations are used instead. Last but not least, a successful evasion will normally prevent a unit from being hit stunned or moved around in any way. That means that annoying stuff like Lake Superior's second skill and Awaken Amy's pull can be prevented when the target unit successfully evades. There are some things that evasion won't stop, like the Matador's second skill and apparently Nicole's passive knockback. Overall, though, Evasion is a great way to let your frontline hold their ground and not get knocked around by an enraged Horizon, Ludmilla Special, and various ultimate attacks. And we're finally done! If you've already watched episode 4 of my PvP guide series, then you now know pretty much all there is to know worth knowing about defensive mechanics. Maybe a few things that weren't worth knowing, but now you know them anyway. If you like this video, but haven't seen that one yet, you should definitely check it out too. If you want to see more guide content like this from me in the future, get subscribed. My next video will probably be a deep dive on exactly how the whole weekly ban and up system works, and how you can try to predict future bans ahead of time, and maybe even get your favorite unit up if you're lucky. It should still be much shorter than this one though. If you have any ideas for what PvP or other guide subjects I should tackle next, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.